Ladies and gentlemen, in our previous lecture, we looked at Russia's failed constitutional experiment. We examined the tensions between the executive and the political parties that emerged after 1905 and were represented in the State Duma. We found that under the fundamental law of 1906, that the monarch was guaranteed a considerable amount of authority and in fact, many of his traditional powers as autocrat were preserved underneath this uh, semi-constitutional or pseudo-constitutional charter. We saw that Nicholas II was no admirer of representative government and that therefore he did what he could to thwart the Duma's influence. At the same time, except for the ultra-nationalists and on some occasions the Octoberists, the political factions in the Duna were, for, from their point of view, also little inclined to cooperate with the emperor. Cadets were interested, some of them, in a republican form of government. The socialist revolutionaries were out and out opponents of the existing order, to say nothing about the social democrats who were committed to a revolution not only in Russia, but across the world. So if stability in representative government depends, to some degree at least, on government finding common ground between executive and legislature and within the legislature uh, between political parties, then Russia's fractious political system offered precious little hope of stability. What hope of stability there existed, if indeed there was hope, disappeared in the First World War in the summer of 1914. Within three short years of the beginning of this conflict, the 300-year Romanov dynasty would be overthrown. Political factions of the Duma would be plunged into a revolutionary situation, into a kind of political free-for-all, each of them struggling for dominance. And the Russian peoples, I say peoples because more than one, remember, was there, over uh, 90 were living in the empire. The Russian peoples were fi finding themselves by 1917 in the midst of a revolutionary vortex in which the future was completely unknown. This lecture today will analyze the diplomatic situation that led Russia in 1914 to move toward war. It will look in some detail at the decision itself in July of 1914 to mobilize, which was tantamount to a declaration of war. It will look at the military strategies pursued by the government and also the impact of the war on the political situation and on the Rup Russian populace. Already two decades before 1914, Russian diplomacy was set against Austria and Germany. The reason is that Russia felt that its interests in the Balkans were incompatible with those of Austria. The Russians wished uh, to exert some measure of protection, some measure of control also, over the South Slav peoples. Uh, it was an old project of the Romanovs to extend their military power all the way to Constantinople, and they hoped uh, that they would be able to affect that result uh, in the not too distant future. But that result was incompatible with the foreign policy of the Austrians. The Austrians, uh, looking at their southern neighbor, the Ottoman Turks, saw the Turkish Empire coming unraveled. They saw opportunities of their own to expand influence into the Balkans. And so these two great powers collided in ways that were really inescapable. Behind the Austrians, which uh, a country that was multinational, and uh, not possessed of a very great army or military force, there stood the remarkable military power of the Germans. And the Germans, it must be said, uh, worked a good deal of mischief 
in the period between 1890 and 1914. Uh, the young emperor, uh, Wilhelm II, did very little to allay the anxieties of the Russians. Indeed, he ratcheted up tensions as part of a conscious uh, political strategy. His public speeches were bellicose. They alarmed not only the Russians, but the French and the British as well. And so a good deal of the blame for the alliance that developed between Russia uh, and the French against Germany and Austria must be laid at the door of the Germans. Now in the best of worlds, the Franco-Russian alliance, the military part of which was signed in 1894, this alliance should have discouraged Austrian aggression in the Balkans. And it should have sobered Wilhelm II as well. And for a time, maybe it did. However, the Russian military defeat in the Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905, and also the revolutionary events of 1905 to 1907, substantially weakened the international standing of the Russians. From the outside, it appeared that Nicholas' regime was a weak and tottering government, uh, one that could not project military force very far, and therefore this opened the door, this perception, to Austrian uh, meddling in the Balkans. In 1908, at the first opportunity, that is, after the 1905-1907 revolution in Russia. In 1908, Austria forcibly annexed Bosnia, that territory that even these days is so much in the news. And this annexation of Bosnia opened the door southward to Austrian and German uh, power in the Balkans. When the Russian foreign ministry pro uh, protested, this annexation, as it was bound to do, the Austrians simply dismissed the protest rather airily, and the Germans expressed their backing for the Austrian move. This was a, a moment of truth, in a sense, because Nicholas II forgave neither the Austrians nor the Germans uh, for the national humiliation that he endured uh, after the annexation of 1908. Russia humiliated, vowed revenge. They sought revenge indirectly by pressing their allies, the Bulgarians and the Serbs, to join each other in an attempt to rid the Balkans of Turkish influence and of Austrian influence as well. And this was a policy that contributed uh, to the Balkan Wars in 1912 and 1913. Meanwhile, in 1912, Russia announced a great rearmament program. It was a program that would call on the might of Russian industry to restore the military power and prestige that had been squandered in the Russo-Japanese War. It was a rearmament program that was supposed to be completed by 1917. Now, it is important for us, I think, to realize that Russia's opposition to Austria and Germany did not necessarily entail war, at least at this point. Everyone in Petersburg realized that until the great armament program was completed, that it would not be in Russia's military interest to fight. They would have to, in the best world, wait till 1917 before they would make a move. And also, at Petersburg, there developed, around 1911, a substantial peace party inside the court and inside the foreign ministry. This was a peace faction that was led by the then prime minister, a man called Vladimir Kokovtsov. He was uh, a financial expert, even a financial genius, and he very much worried that Russia could not afford war. There were other people who joined the peace party for different reasons. Uh, a man uh, by the name of Kaso, who was the Minister of Education, was worried that if Russia went to war with a nation as strong as Germany, that it would surely lose, and what would happen would be the undoing of the empire, because Russia would come apart in a thousand pieces the way it had almost done 
uh, in 1905. And the foreign minister himself, a man called Sergei Sazonov, a member of the state council, Baron Mikhail Tauba, who was very well respected, who knew Nicholas on personal terms. These men as well were members of the peace party. They wanted to delay Russian involvement in any military conflict and avoid it if at all possible. The influence of this so-called peace party was more than counterbalanced by the hardliners, by the war party, uh, which got stronger and stronger as tensions grew in the Balkans. Balkan Wars in 1912 and 1913 led to a situation when in most European capitals, war was anticipated on an imminent basis. Indeed, the betting was that war would happen in 1913, and uh, statesmen who lived long enough to write their memoirs and look back on events were rather surprised that it happened a year later, uh, of course, in, in retrospect. This hardline group at the Russian court was led by War Minister Vladimir Sukhonlinov, who was the man that lobbied for the Great Rearmament Campaign, but who decided by November of 1912 that war was inevitable. He told the uh, War Council in Petersburg, quote, we shall have a war anyway, we cannot avoid it, and it would be more profitable for us to begin it as soon as possible. The hardliners also received support from self-proclaimed Russian patriots, some in the Duma, some at court and outside of it. Even members of the Constitutional Democratic Party, which had a wing uh, of liberal pacifists, uh, they became increasingly drawn to the conclusion that Russia would have to go to war to protect its interests. The leader of the Constitutional Democratic Party, Paul Milyukov, uh, when war was declared in, in 1914, he had been a pacifist earlier, he joined the bulk of his party in calling for a Russian victory at all costs. Over time, as the diplomatic situation in the Balkans stubbornly, very stubbornly, ref refused to improve, the influence of hardliners within the Russian government increased, and their hold over Nicholas II increased as well. When, in February of 1914, Prime Minister Kokovtsev was dismissed by Nicholas II, Baron Tauba wrote in his diary that this was a bad sign, that he thought this would uh, lead to a political watershed and the triumph of the hardliners. Now, Russia actually decided to go to war in the wake of the well-known events at Sarajevo uh, in July of 1914, the assassination of the Austrian Grand Duke Franz Ferdinand, the killing of his wife at the hands of a Serbian nationalist group called the Black Hand. And this was an assassination that led to an Austrian ultimatum against Serbia, uh, an ultimatum that the Serbians tried to accept, incidentally, on Petersburg's advice, uh, but they simply were not given wiggle room by the Austrians. They had one caveat to one proposal, and uh, the Austrians used uh, this caveat as an indication of a refusal to accept their memorandum, and so they be began a bombardment of the Serbian capital. Now, when these events occurred, the Russians assessed the situation. In my view, the crucial meeting took place uh, in Russia on the 30th of July, 1914, uh, between the head of the Russian general staff, a man called General Yanuskevich, and the foreign minister, Sergei Sazonov. Sazonov was called on the phone by Yanuskevich, asked to come to the uh, Yanuskevich's military headquarters to discuss the situation. When the foreign minister arrived, he received a briefing uh, that informed him that the Russian army now believed war to be inevitable. Russia would have uh, to complete its mobilization. It had by this point already partially mobilized its forces, but it now would have to go on full mobilization. 
because Yanuskevich said the Germans have made secret moves, they are actually much further along in their own military mobilization than is known in the government, and therefore if we allow this to continue without opposition, uh, the Germans will have the possibility of overwhelming our defenses. We shall have to fight with our sword not taken out of the scabbard, were the terms that uh, Yanuskevich uh, mentioned. In view of these developments, Yanushkevich told the foreign minister to speak to the emperor, speak to Nicholas II, and Yanushkevich implored Sazonov, tell Nicholas that the time has arrived, tell him to authorize complete mobilization, and reconcile him to the prospect that this will mean war. Although Sazonov had been up to this point a member of the peace party, he decided that war was inevitable, and with heavy heart, he phoned uh, the uh, commander of Palace and was asked for and asked for a conference with the Tsar. That same afternoon, Sazonov met alone with the Tsar, and we know about this meeting from his memoirs. For an hour, he described the diplomatic and military situation confronting Russia. The Russian appeal that the great powers meet in a European Congress to sort out the problem had been rejected by the Germans. The British offer of a mediation, which had been made by Lord Grey, had come to nothing. The Russian general staff, as Onuf said, had now come to the conclusion that military disaster would occur unless the Russians acted. At the end of the foreign minister's remarks, Nicholas informed Sazonov of a coded message that he had just refer, uh, received from the Germans, from Kaiser Wilhelm II himself. This was a message in which the Kaiser curtly informed the Tsar that unless Russia suspended its partial mobilization against Austria, then, Nicol then uh, uh, the Kaiser could not answer for the consequences, a polite way of saying that war will follow. Nicholas bitterly observed that the Kaiser, quote, has forgotten or deliberately failed to notice that the Austrian mobilization began before Russia's. He pointed out that now the Kaiser is demanding that we suspend our mobilization without a word about Austria's. If I accept the German demands, we shall face the mobilized Austrian army unarmed, and that would be madness. Sazonov then insisted that war could no longer be avoided. The Austrians, the Germans, had long ago decided to fight, and now Russia would have to do the same. And yet still, Nicholas hesitated. When Sazonov confronted the Tsar, who had fallen silent in his hesitation, Nicholas said, to fight means to sentence hundreds of thousands of Russians to death how can one not shrink from such a consequence? After a further plea from Zazonov, the Tsar fell silent again, struggling with his own emotions, possibly with his conscience. And finally he spoke, you are right, we can do nothing but await an attack, contact the general staff, and issue the order for mobilization. By midnight on the 30th, Russia had begun its mobilization and the German declaration of war followed within 24 hours. Now, Sazonov's account of the fateful meeting of the 30th of July helps us, I think, to understand Russia's decision to go to war. The Tsar, in his own mind, did not seek war. He accepted it because he felt that the Austrians and Germans had resorted to aggression, intolerable aggression, against his ally, the Serbians. He believed that the Austrian-German Austrian aggression was a national humiliation for Russia, again, before world opinion, something that he would not countenance twice. And he believed that the aggressive intent that lay behind the Austrian-German decision uh, would open the way for Russia's own destruction. The Tsar recognized that the war would sentence hundreds of thousands of Russians to death. He did not welcome this prospect plainly, but he could not avert it. 
Now, so far we may agree with Sazonov, but it seems to me we can enter a caveat here about his conclusions. By Sazonov's reckoning, Nicholas acted properly on the 30th of July, 1914. The decision to mobilize was an inevitable step that the Russians had to make for which they had no desire and no culpability whatsoever. The key to peace, according to this notion, had never been in Petersburg. It had always lay in Vienna and Berlin, and therefore someone else was responsible. But these conclusions, it seemed to me, failed to recognize that Russian hardliners all along had been telling the Tsar that he would have to fight, and that Nicholas had earlier played some role in the deterioration of European peace. And think of the what if. What if he had not fought? Could his dynasty have been saved? Could the empire have remained whole? The consequence of this decision in historical terms is enormous. And retrospectively, one might think that the Tsar would have listened uh, to another voice, maybe the better angel of his nature, were such a voice uh, to make itself felt. Well, the deed was done. Russia was at war. How did the populace respond to this dread situation? At first, even in the cities, Russians greeted the war with a general enthusiasm. In St. Petersburg, there were large crowds from all walks of life, according to memoirists, who participated in patriotic demonstrations. Demonstrators paraded down the center of town, down the Nevsky Prospect, holding icons, holding portraits of the Tsar, holding the Russian flag, singing the national hymn, God Save the Tsar. As I noted before in an earlier lecture at Palace Square, when Nicholas came out on the balcony to see his people, they knelt, they sang the national anthem again in a gesture of submission to him and of agreement with the uh, course that he had chosen. Now, even if we take into account the role of the city police and the clergy in organizing these demonstrations, nevertheless, subtracting all of those factors out, there was, I think, a genuine, irreducible element of popular enthusiasm. And this was surprising. It was surprising to Tauba, who was a member of the Peace Party, for he said, this was neither a dream nor a mirage. All those people out on the streets. Now, although the urban populace generally rallied to the war cause, people in the countryside were a little more reluctant to go to war. And we can tell this by what happened during the course of mobilization. Generally speaking, for Russia, where things are slow to happen, it was a successful mobilization. So people left their families, went to war when they heard the call to arms. But there were moments of difficulty in the countryside that uh, perhaps we should mention. For example, at a few places there were riots at mobilization points involving peasants who didn't want to go. There were 225 dead, 187 seriously wounded during the course of mobilization. It was not entirely peaceable, and most of the problems were in the back country. So the peasants were not happy about having to uh, engage in the conflict. And I should also mention that amongst those dead were 60 government officials. So violence was not just directed by those running the mobilization against people that didn't want to go, but it moved the other way uh, as well, from social inferior to uh, social superior. Now, of course, the government put the best face on these events, but in light of what was to come, we should not forget about them because they are a harbinger of the political turmoil that followed. Leading political parties, for their part, mostly supported the war, albeit for different reasons. The ultra-nationalists, as we would expect, were supporters. The constitutional democrats I have talked about, they were supporters of the war to a victorious conclusion. Uh, that was their consistent policy. Uh, 
The agrarian socialists, the SRs, did not favor an aggressive war. They agreed to the war so long as it remained defensive. The way that the government spun, there were spin doctors before the name spin doctors, the way the government spun the story of diplomacy, Russia was under attack by ruthless invaders from the outside, the Austrians and the Germans. And so the SR swallowed this line, and they believed that Russia uh, would have to be defended against these Western invaders. And so they signed on uh, politically in the Duma to the invasion. It's interesting that even some social democrats agreed with the line that the war was a defensive war. Now, we should not be surprised by this, because after all, in Germany and in France, socialists, even pacifists, when things came uh, to a head in 1914, reluctantly voted war credits, reluctantly supported the regime, joined in France the Union Sacrée, the sacred union of patriotic Frenchmen, and, and so on. So some SDs, some social democrats, took this position. Even the founder of Russian Marxism, Georgi Plekhanov, went along with the war. The only consistent opposition to the war from the very beginning came from the Bolshevik faction of the Social Democrats and was initiated by Lenin. And this was a political decision that one has to say retrospectively was a decision of genius. It, it proceeded, of course, from deep ideological aversion to the war, which Lenin regarded as a capitalist war. But it was uh, a, de a decision that played very well in the long term when Russia's military fortunes, uh, as it were, went south, began to uh, go sour. The Russians began to do badly. What about Russian intellectuals? Well, most of them, even left-leaning ones, tended to support the war. For example, the avant-garde painter Kasimir Malevich drew posters showing heroic Russian soldiers confronting incompetent Germans. The left-leaning graphic artist Dmitry Moore did similar kinds of portraits. Vladimir Mayakovsky who would later become a Bolshevik, but at this point was an avant-garde poet. Uh, he also drew cartoons in favor of the war and even wrote pro-war poetry. The only important exception that I know to the war fervor amongst intellectuals was the young Anna Akhmatova, probably the greatest Russian poet of the 20th century, in a wonderful verse called July 1914, she warned that the war would bring disaster upon Russia. Terrible times are drawing near, she warned, and soon the earth will be packed with fresh graves. This was perhaps the first time that Akhmatova displayed her uncanny prophetic gifts. Now, like most Europeans, the Russians assumed that win or lose, the war would be a short war. They reasoned from their own experience in the Russo-Japanese War. It was a relatively short war. They reasoned from the very much more significant conflict uh, between Prussia and France in 1870, which is uh, 71, which was over very quickly. They assumed that for all sorts of reasons, a long war could not be sustained. One Russian minister calculated that each additional day of war would cost three million rubles. He didn't see how the treasury could sustain that kind of investment over the long term. Russians, like the Germans and the French, had laid in armaments for about six months, give or take a little, of warfare. And they assumed that the war itself, the bulk of the campaign, would be over in three or four months. Talbo remembers running into a soldier, and he said, how long do you think this war will last? And the soldier said confidently, I think we'll be in Berlin by Christmas. And Talbo said, and if not, then what? The soldier said, well, that's inconceivable. 
To effect a swift conclusion to the war, Russia adopted a war plan that it had been working on since 1909, and it had worked on it in concert with the French general staff. What Russia did, it had six major army groups. It took two of them and launched an immediate attack to the northwest against the Prussians, against the German troops that were staged in Prussia. Now, the object of this attack was not to defeat the Germans. The Russians were that, not that naive as to think a two-army group invasion would do that. But it would force the Germans to take troops from their invasion of France, which everyone knew was going to happen, and defend their rear flank. That would pull the plug on the offensive steamroller that the Germans had launched against the French. It would turn the war into a two-front war in which the French and the Russians would have the advantage. The bulk of the Russian attack was supposed to go to the south. Four army groups were to be sent against the Austrians. And in Petersburg, the calculation was that this attack will be victorious and it will drive the Austrians immediately from the war. Now, to simplify very greatly, it didn't happen that way. The Russians succeeded in stopping the German offensive to the west indirectly. That happened. The Russians did very well against the Austrians, but not well enough to knock them out of the war. And once this initial war plan had come undone, the Russians had the worst of all possible worlds. They had not a short war, but a long war. And in the case of a long war, all of the resentments that we have talked about, all of the difficulties that Russia had politically between the executive and the parties in the Duma, all of those would come to the surface and ultimately destroy the empire. All the poisons in the grass would hatch out. By the end of the fall, 1914, Russia had lost 1.5 million troops by December. And into the spring of 1915, Russians were involved in what uh, has subsequently come to be known as the Great Retreat. They are now fighting on their own imperial territory with all of the disorder and destruction uh, that one can uh, imagine attending that. By the spring of 1915, the initial supply of ammunition and shells had run out so that Russian reserves in 1915 were being sent into the field without arms. Uh, they would have to wait until comrades uh, in front of them were killed, and then and only then could they pick up a weapon and use it to fight. The government, mistakenly, I think, ordered shells and munitions from the British firm Vickers, also from the Remington Company in the United States, uh, but the British had their own problems. Remington was slow to convert to war production, and so the Russians waited a long time uh, and didn't get many shells and so on as a result. So one thing led to another. Uh, you don't need me to tell you that war is full of surprise and that it is hell. In the summer of 1914, the Russians faced a very serious political crisis. This was a crisis that came to bear between the executive and the Duma. In the Duma, the initial support for the administrations had all but evaporated because it was clear that the strategy that the Tsar and his military men had adopted was not successful in the field. And in fact, there was grumbling that Sukholinov, the Minister of War, who was author of much of the strategy, was in fact a traitor, a German agent. And he was arrested and he was brought to trial uh, on grounds of treason and corruption, uh, which is an unthinkable thing, you would, uh, you would suppose, in time of conflict. The Duma felt as a body, there were exceptions, but as a body it felt collectively that it should be let in to the decision-making process, that the government should license it 
to make decisions about medical care, that there were representatives of the Duma who were capable of serving as ministers, and that they should not be refused the possibility to exercise uh, their patriotic duty as other Russians. They wanted to be a given voice in a war situation. And Nicholas resisted them despite the uh, warnings from his own government that it might be wise to buy off the Duma at this point. He resisted them because he thought to surrender political authority in the middle of a war was madness. It was crazy. And Alexandra and Rasputin, her favorite, both of them in different ways helped Nicholas uh, to stay steadfast in his opposition to giving the Duma more authority. What exactly did the Duma want? It wanted something called a ministry of confidence. It wanted the Tsar to appoint ministers from amongst a group of nominees named by the Duma. In other words, the Duma wanted uh, sign-off power on the appointment of ministers. And it was clear from Nicholas' point of view that this was, uh, in fact, granting of a constitutional authority, which he had resisted up to this point. And rather than do this, rather than grant a ministry of, con uh, of confidence, let alone any, anything else, Nicholas decided on a dramatic move. He decided to take the command of the armed forces himself to move to the place called Mogilyov, which is a, a small city, uh, and there to uh, be with the general staff and from there to visit soldiers and rouse Russian patriotic fervor. The amazing thing is that for a very brief time, Nicholas got lucky. The strategy worked. The German offensive of the summer stalled. This confounded the critics. He felt that God was with him once again. But luck doesn't last. We know this too well. By 1916, Russia had prepared one last uh, offensive. It was an offensive led by an able general, a man called Brusilov. Uh, it took many uh, tens of thousands of Austrian pris prisoners, over a million, over a four-month campaign in the summer. It took 10,000 uh, square kilometers of Austrian territory. It broke the Austrian army such that the Germans had to send reinforcements to Austria in order to uh, salvage some kind of fighting force in the south. But in the process, Russia exhausted itself. The Brusilov Offensive of 1916 was a desperate gamble, in fact. If Nicholas and the Russian forces had won, in 1916, maybe, it was an outside possibility, maybe the empire could have been saved. But when it failed, like all the other offensives failed, the final hopes of the regime politically as well as militarily were dashed. In November of 1916, at a Duma session, the leader of the cadet party, Paul Milyukov, appeared and he gave a famous speech called the Stupidity or Treason Speech. He recited a list of the errors of the imperial government. And he asked after each error, is it stupidity or is it treason? And his conclusion was, it really doesn't matter whether it's one or the other. The consequence for Russia is the same. Lane beneath the lines of this speech, which was incidentally distributed in lithographed form in the trenches. It had a devastating effect on the morale of those people that had survived in the trenches, and it turned their minds toward revolution as much as any other act of this period. Laying between the lines of this speech was a message. The Duma can no longer work with the government. We, the cadet party, which is a moderate constitutional party, can no longer trust Nicholas. Uh, 
We think, in fact, the speech implied that the wife of Nicholas, Alexandra, who was of German extraction, that she may be a traitor. Rasputin, who was a pacifist, may be an unwitting traitor. And so, readers were left to draw the conclusion for themselves that power would have to be taken out of the hands of the regime. Now what followed the November 1916 speech is very interesting. An ultra-rightist man called Puriskevich, a member of the National Party, who had utter contempt for the Duma. He once walked into a session of the Duma with a red carnation stuck in his fly as a sign of his contempt for this whole debating chamber and for the Russian false constitutional system. Puriskevich himself gave a speech that really supported Milyukov's point. He talked about dark forces close to the throne. He talked about the need for action. And soon, Puriskevich himself, along with a few of his intimates, did take action. December 1916, they agreed in a kind of quiet conspiracy to kill Rasputin, the favorite of Empress Alexandra. They poisoned him, they shot him, they threw the body into the Neva after having wrapped it with chains. Puriskevich, a member of the royal family and also a prince of the blood, were involved in this plot and carried out the assassination. That's how close to His Majesty Nicholas and Alexandra the conspiracy came. And still, of course, it was unavailing. Nothing happened. Meanwhile, liberals of various stripes, Mil Milyukov was not one of them, but the head of the uh, October's party, Guchkov was, and uh, a man called Lvov, who was a prominent member of the uh, cadet party, they were involved. These men hatched palace conspiracies against Nicholas. One of the conspirators even contacted the Grand Duke Nikolai, Nikolaich, the man who had been the commander of the Russian armed forces before Nicholas, and asked him would he participate in the conspiracy. And the interesting thing is, after pondering for two days, Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaich decided that the conspiracy couldn't reasonably be brought off, but he did not inform the authorities of a plot to arrest the Tsar. So in short, it seems to me, by 1916, late in the year, early 1917, revolution in Russia was very close indeed. It was breathing down the neck of the emperor and his retinue. Look at the situation. The Duma, virtually all of the political parties, responsible leaders of them, were now in opposition. Soldiers had given up the hope of victory. There were many people in the trenches reading, as the secret police told Nicholas was the case, reading the stupidity and treason speech. The intimate of Alexandra, Rasputin, had been murdered. So Nicholas was alone, he was isolated, and it only awaited the dropping of the historical shoe to remove him from the throne. Whence did this shoe come from? It came not from the liberals, incidentally, not from the Duma, as one would expect, the decisive moment came when workers in Petrograd, because of difficulties of their own, rioted in the street, went out of control, and the imperial government there proved powerless to arrest their discontent. 